The VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. Whether you're a veteran voice actor, just starting out, or don't even know how to set a level, we're here to help you avoid the pitfalls along your voiceover path to success. The VO Meter is brought to you by Voice Actor Websites, Voice123, Studio Bricks, Global Voice Acting Academy, JMC Demos, and Sennheiser. The VO Meter is produced in part using Source Connect, made by source-elements.com. And now, your hosts, Paul Stefano and Sean Daly. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 99 of the VO Meter. Measuring your voice over progress. So today we are recapping, or redoing, I should say, or reduxing, I think I said during the live interview portion, the Live Announce Roundtable. It's an episode we did in our first year of production of the podcast when I was sort of retired from doing live announcing. But since then, it's been a significant part of my business, and we thought we'd have a lot of the same people on. So we did. We, we got back Adrian Robertson, Mike Norgard. We invited Bob Johnson. Unfortunately, he was not able to come. Uh, but then we also added Mark Fratto, uh, Doug Turkell, and Joey Shalio to talk about the state of live announcing, specifically to sports, but we mix in some other topics as well. And we'll get to that interview in a few minutes. So we had so many great guests, and thank you, everyone, for being on the podcast. But we didn't actually have a chance to ask you some of these questions, Paul, because, I mean, your attachment to live announce is kind of what inspired this whole idea in the first place. So I'd love to hear from you. How did you start getting into live announce in the first place? Well, my initial foray into it was with my alma mater, and it was sort of by accident. I had some friends who were doing it. Uh, that school is Towson University, just outside Baltimore. It's about five miles from where I currently live. I had some friends who were doing it sort of as a side gig. They weren't really even voiceover or professional announcers. And I kept in touch with them, and one of them said, Hey, I could use some help. Do you want to Do you want to try and do it? And I said, uh, sure. I don't really have any experience other than like goofing around in, in classrooms in college, but sure, I'll do it. So they put me on the roster and they just basically taught me how to do it. Announcing initially volleyball, field hockey, and uh, men's and women's basketball and men's and women's soccer. And each of those, they just sort of sat me down and took me under their wing and said, here's what you should say, here's when you should say it, and uh, you're off to the races. So I did that for a couple of years probably five or six years while I was doing my other various jobs, not related to voiceover. So this is back in 2005, 2000, 2005 to the 2010 time frame. And I was working first for the, let's see, the, I guess the, still the Baltimore Orioles, the baseball team. And then I was working for the online university. And I was just doing this for fun on the weekends and nights when I had time. So I eventually sort of got retired from that job because... There was a new athletic director, and as often happens when a new athletic director comes into a university or a college, they all sort of clean house. And the same thing happens with professional sports, too, when there's a new general manager or a new vice president of operations. They will generally hire all their own staff, from coaches, sometimes all the way down to marketing people, and sometimes including the announcer. So I was just sort of not called back. I never was really fired, never really told I wasn't working there anymore, but they said... Uh, but they, they didn't call me one season, and I figured that was it. So I was done. And that's about the time we started the uh, the podcast. And that's what I said in that initial episode, was that I no longer really do public address announcing. I would like to someday, but I'm kind of retired. <laughs> in between gigs at the moment. Mm -hmm. but, well, that's awesome. So you, you pretty much mentioned your, your sort of your training while you did that. But I'm curious about is what kind of relevant skills do you think people who – want to pursue live announce need to have well i think there are a lot of the same skills we use for voiceover um improv helps tremendously because oftentimes you're making things up on the fly i'll sometimes get a piece of paper from a uh, director of operations game day operations that just says uh we have a commercial and we need to read this right now and it'll hand it to me and be like go and other times they'll say we need to make something up they'll say we just got this this new sponsor it's Bob's Car Wash. I don't have anything to say about it other than he's located in, I don't know, um, Steubenville, Ohio. And you got to talk about it right now. So make something up. And I'll just say, Bob's Car Wash in Steubenville is a proud sponsor of XYZ Athletics. 
please welcome our new sponsor, Bob's. And that's it. That, I just have to make it up on the fly. So <laughs> improv is a big part of it. I guess uh, mic technique, because it's kind of different from some other genres, because you are sometimes shouting. You are sometimes adjusting the, the timbre of your voice based on whether it's uh, a starting lineup or you're announcing a commercial or you're doing a contest. Oftentimes there's these silly uh, fan favorite contests that we do with inside an arena or inside an arena or stadium to keep the, the fun going during commercial breaks or during breaks in the game, whether whatever kind of sport that might be. Baseball is the classic example because there's only three outs and then there's a big break and there's three outs again at a big break. So in between each inning, there's usually some sort of promotion that the team is doing and I have to announce those and get excited. So I guess mic technique and improv are the two big ones. Awesome. So what's your favorite part about it? My favorite part is just being out of the booth. As you know, we spend almost all of our time either inside a booth recording by ourselves like we are now or connected to one other person through a, through a source connect like we are now. Or I'm editing, also sitting at a desk by myself with headphones on. So I just like being out with real people and getting to interact with crowds and talking to people outside my little booth, my little VO world, or my family. Uh, it's nice to, to see and hear other people. And I also sort of get jazzed up from the response from the crowd. So I haven't done stand-up comedy, but I imagine it's a little bit like that. Um, oftentimes when I'm talking... Everyone can hear me, and I'll get the response live from the crowd, whether it be cheers, sometimes boos, laughs, sometimes cheering. So when I announce something and the crowd responds, it's, it's, it's really kind of an ego boost because, again, we don't get that very often in the VO world. We're talking to nobody in, in a dead room, dead sound speaking, and we don't get any response whatsoever. So when I get that feedback from the crowd, it really is invigorating, and that's kind of my favorite thing. No, absolutely. I mean, if you've uh, anyone in listening in the audience has ever done stage or live performance, you know that immediate feedback and that just that energy loop of the audience can be so addictive. Yeah, as you know, I haven't done live theater, but this is probably the equivalent, and and it definitely energizes you, and it's a lot of fun. So you mentioned doing work for some prestigious teams in the past. What was the biggest venue you've announced for? The biggest venue is. CQ Stadium at the University of Maryland in College Park. So that holds just over or just under 60,000 people. Now, it wasn't full. I've, I've only done it for lacrosse games where they get about uh, an eighth of that. But I still had the big building in front of me. I could see all the seats and I took a picture right away and, and, and because I knew it was the biggest arena I had been in or biggest biggest venue I had been in. And uh, it was impressive just to see all those seats. And then also with the windows open in the press box, hear my voice reverberating around a 60,000-seat stadium. So that's the biggest venue. Biggest crowd, uh, I think, was the NCAA championships for men's lacrosse, which I did over the last season. And that was probably about 7,000 people, I think, was the crowd they announced. So th the biggest number is about 7,000 people. Biggest venue, just under 60,000 seats. Crazy. So kind of a two-part question. What's the strangest event you've ever done, or what's the strangest, most quirky thing you've had to do during an event? The strangest event has to be the End Hunger Dragon Boat Festival in North Beach, Maryland, which is a town on the eastern side of the Chesapeake Bay. So if you know the geography of the Maryland area, the outside of the state is sort of split by the Chesapeake Bay. So there's the, the eastern shore, which is all the way across the bay. And then there's the, the western part of the state, which is anything from, like, Baltimore west. And then there's, there's the two sides of the shore. So there's the, the western part of the eastern shore and the eastern part of the eastern shore. It's a little confusing. But basically where the bay splits Maryland in half, there is a, a whole uh, bevy of beach towns that go along the coast. And they're the suburbs of Washington, D.C., they're not actually like tidal, tidal um, beach towns, so there's no waves or surfing because they're protected by the other side of the shore. But they do have waterfronts and boating and crabbing and fishing are big industries there. So there's this one town that has a dragon boat charity festival, where a dragon boat race charity festival, where they have teams of local businesses or nonprofit organizations take pledges and raise money to donate to the local food bank. And all these teams get in these 
boats that have dragons on the front. It's sort of a thing around the country I've learned, but there's a dragon head that is built and decorated by, by the team. And then they row, sort of like Viking ships on either side. There's one, one row on the left, one row on the right, and they each have a single oar. And they row down, down the bay in a race. So they set up sort of like a car race or a drag race, and uh, they have a live announcer, in this case me, announce the race as is happening. So I was replacing someone who had done this for a long time, a local per TV personality from the Washington, D.C., uh, I think ABC? I, I, I can't remember the exact network, but he was the weather guy on the local local news. And he unfortunately passed away, and they needed somebody quickly. And they found me on Upwork, of all places, and uh, kind of threw me out there without a whole lot of direction. They just said, basically, Do you, have you done any racing experience? And I sort of had. I had done horse racing before, and that's how I kind of approached it. But with not a whole lot of prep, they just said, all right, here's the, here's the races. You're going to announce the entries the sponsor, and then describe the race as it's going on. So I posted this on social media some, a couple times on Instagram and, and TikTok. I basically just announced it like it was happening at a, at a horse race. So I would announce the entries like the boats are now reaching the starting gate. Looks like they're ready to go. There, there actually is a marshal. So the, 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 the quirkiest thing was that they had this company whose only job is to set up these charity boat races around the country. They do it in, in, or around the world. The, I think they were in Montreal, Canada, right before this this event that I was doing, and they do New York and Crazy. the West Coast. So there's a, an organization that tells you when the race starts. There's a, an actual marshal to start the race, and then there's a finish line and, and an official who tells you when it's over. So I just announced it as it was going, and it was a big hit. They invited me back the next year, and I plan to do it for the for the uh, foreseeable future. Excellent. Well, speaking about your career and foreseeable future so where do you see the future of announcing and do you think ai is going to creep into a lot of that work yeah we talked about this during the during the the interview portion with with the the guests and my personal opinion is that it'll be one of the last things to go and it's one of the reasons i've tried to ramp it up in my own business portfolio i think it's almost impossible to recreate lots of the things we do because of the the reasons i mentioned earlier because so much of it is on the fly and is made up as you go along just because of the nature of the way the events work. I think it's relatively insulated from AI. Now, some of those, I think Doug mentioned a couple of instances where he could see like pre-recorded announcements being done with AI, and I guess that's probably true. So a lot of the things I announce could be pre-recorded, and in fact, I've done that for people before. But... Uh, my opinion is that the live events themselves will never be able to be replaced completely by AI because of the way those events happen. They're just they're just too unpredictable. You need a whole crew of people, not just announcers. You need a, a stage director, a technical director, a live DJ. You need all those jobs which are being crept up on by AI. By AI. You need all of those in person, live, to be done on the fly at the events. And for, for that reason, I think it's going to be the last bastion of of performance that isn't affected by AI. Definitely. I feel like we'll be cyborg announcers before we're completely replaced. <laughs> and uh, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't I think it's a, it is a good place to make use of some of that technology. So if I don't have to read the um, the Oscar Mayer hot dog ad a thousand times a week, I could just <laughs> record that once or have an AI version of myself do it where I still get paid for it, I think that would be great. So maybe there's some ways to work in the positive aspects of AI or um, or automation to make that job easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are already pre-recorded announcements that go on. It's just another element to that. Yeah, I would agree. Well, thanks, Paul. I'm glad that we had a chance to ask you these things. And now our audience is queued in for what we're going to ask our uh, our new guests. So we'll get to that right after these messages. How many times has this happened to you? You're listening to the radio when this commercial comes on. Not unlike this one. And this guy starts talking. Not unlike myself. Or maybe it's a woman that starts talking. Not unlike myself. And you think to yourself, geez, I could do that. Well, mister, well, missy, you just got one step closer to realizing your dream as a voiceover artist. Because now there's Global Voice Acting Academy. 
All the tools and straight from the hip, honest information you need to get on a fast track to doing this commercial yourself. Well, not this one exactly. Classes, private coaching, webinars, home studio setup, marketing and branding help, members only benefits like workouts, rate and negotiation advice, practice scripts, and more. All without the kind of hype you're listening to right now. Go ahead, take our jobs from us. We dare you. Speak for yourself, buddy. I like what I do. And you will, too, when you're learning your craft at Global Voice Acting Academy. Find us at globalvoiceacademy.com. Because you like to have fun. Hey, Paul, did you know Voice123, the largest online marketplace for voice actors, just celebrated its 20th year anniversary? Whoa, really? That's amazing. Doesn't really surprise me, though. I've used Voice123 since the beginning of my career. I remember way back in my first year where I booked a job as a hypnotist. I actually got to say... You are getting very sleepy on a radio ad. The whole thing was super easy. They even paid me right away for the audition and said that was all they needed. I've been a member of Voice123 for years as well. I've always enjoyed their upfront policies, ability to contact clients directly, and their commitment to the voiceover industry. Totally. CEO Rolf Veldman has appeared on the show before, and in every interaction I've had with him and the company, I felt a sense of trust, like they really care. Well, if you want a great place to find your VO niche and find yourself as a voice actor, visit voice123.com for more information. Now, VO Meter listeners can also get 15% off premium tier memberships. For more information, visit our website and click on the Click Here to Say 15% banner on our sponsors page. Voice123, speak for yourself. Studio Bricks designs and creates the highest performing portable sound isolation booths. Their professionally perfected acoustics enhances your performance and takes your recording to their maximum quality from your home studio. Forget about managing noise conflicts with your neighbors and family. Pursue your passion for voiceover on your own time and on your own terms. Walgreens, because it's flu season, and you live in a place with doorknobs and handrails and, you know, people. We tried booking a vacation rental on one of those other websites. They don't always tell you everything. The stars take it to the red carpet. We are back live from the red carpet. California leads the way for change in America, and so does Kamala Harris. Rated M for Mature. Claire Redfield. And who exactly are you? So, yeah, what hashtag should I use to describe a grown man in a tuxedo wrestling a goat? And prior to 1933, many of them belonged to a variety of political parties that were now outlawed in Germany. This is the story of how Q got curly. Quinn was crazy about curls. Curly fries, curly straws, curly-haired dogs. Hey, Jay Michael here. Thanks for listening to the VO Meter Podcast. It's one of my favorites. If you're looking for a great demo like the ones you just heard, check out jmcdemos.com for more information. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our 2023 Public Address Roundtable. Now, we did a similar show way back in 2018, hard to believe, with many of the same guests. At that time, I was actually recently forced into an early retirement by some leadership changes at the school at which I worked. But since then, and mostly over the last two years, I've picked up steam, not only returning to that same school, which was also my alma mater, but adding four more universities, a pro lacrosse league, a lacrosse world championship, minor league baseball, and both NCAA first round and quarterfinal round tournament experiences. So I thought it might be time to revisit the topic and how this specific niche of voiceover fits into the rest of the voiceover world, how it works, how to find work, and most importantly, uh, how much fun it is. So we have an amazing panel today of professional announcers, and I was hoping we could go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves. So from my point of view, it looks like Joey is up first. So Joey, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Joey Shalio. I'm primarily a voiceover actor, uh, but I also do live announce for sports and uh, graduation ceremonies and galas and charity, you know, events, all kinds of things. Um, but uh, but day in and day out, I'm mostly a voice actor. Fantastic. Welcome. Adrian. I'm Adrian Robertson. I live in Maryland. I am primarily sports announcer, currently for the Baltimore Orioles, been doing baseball for over 20 years, but I also cover a lot of other sports, uh, including Georgetown University, pretty much every sport there. So that's me. Welcome, uh, Mark. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Brado. I'm the announcer for the Washington Wizards for New York City Football Club at Yankee Stadium and City Field in New York. 
And for Army football, I also do ring announcing for pro boxing and MMA. I was in one movie. Doesn't make me a movie star, if you ask me. Uh, it's, hey, am I, you know, that's for, is that for me to say? You know, I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't really know. Um, uh, the announcer in Halle Berry's MMA movie called Bruised, which was a fun and unique experience. And uh, I'm one of the voices on NBA 2K, as all the team's home announcers are featured uh, on that video game as well. So uh, getting into some other things this fall, uh, I also run a company that does uh, television broadcast and streaming. And uh, like a lot of the people on this panel, I'm based in Maryland, in the Annapolis area right now. So happy to be here. You guys can uh, go on my IMDb and vote to see if I'm a movie star or not. <laughs> Will do. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Doug. Hey, Paul. I'm Doug Turkel. I'm a full-time voiceover guy and audio producer. I produce radio commercials and promos, audio for television commercials, uh, do some live announce for things like award ceremonies and corporate events. In the past, I did a lot of hockey PA, but these days most of my PA work is in soccer. I did the first season for Intermine ECF when they joined MLS. Do lots of other soccer games here in South Florida. I'm based in Miami. I've announced CONCACAF Gold Cup games, U.S. Men's National Team, World Cup qualifiers, and international friendlies. Fantastic. Welcome, Doug. And Mike. Hey, I'm Mike Norgard. I'm in the Dallas, Texas area. Uh, Full-time voiceover guy. I do a lot of uh, promo narration audiobook work and kind of supplement that with the sports and live and out stuff and I do football baseball hockey basketball uh, primarily fantastic and last but not least our fearless co-host Sean why don't you introduce yourself and <laughs> do the first question well, I'm kind of the odd man out for two reasons. One, I'm on the West Coast, and I don't do a lot of sports and outs, so I'm not going to talk much this episode, but I'm fascinated. So a lot of people are probably wondering, how did you all get your first PA job, and what about your most recent one? So we'll start with you, Doug. Oh, yeah. Um, my first job was back in the 90s, and it was <laughs> came about in a really weird way. <laughs> I was playing in a roller hockey league, and I had a teammate who knew that I worked in radio. He told me that his mom was the GM of a new professional inline roller hockey team. That's actually a thing. <laughs> they were coming to Miami. They needed a PA announcer. So he gave me her phone number. I called her. Uh, season was starting in a couple of weeks. She offered me the job during that call. Except I had never done any PA before. <laughs> So she figured that the fact that I was on the radio was enough experience. I don't think that was really true, but <laughs> I actually, I literally went to Blockbuster Video, rented every hockey tape I could find because I grew up in Miami. I didn't even know hockey very well. I listened to the PA announcers in the background of all those highlight videos, kind of pieced together the basics of how to announce a hockey game, somehow made that work. Luckily for me, the team shared the building with a brand new NHL team, the Florida Panthers. And within a couple of years of doing those inline roller hockey games, I became the Panthers backup PA guy as well. All from that, just because I happened to play roller hockey with this kid. That's great. So, How about your most recent job? Um, my most recent one I got, it all stemmed from hearing that MLS was going to have an expansion team here in Miami. So, uh, about a year before they they started playing, I tracked down the guy who was producing those games because the team hired a producer to bring in a lot of the game day staff and met with him, auditioned for him, and ended up getting the gig doing Inner Miami games. And that same guy produces a lot of other games in South Florida, which has led me to the CONCACAF stuff, the U.S. men's national team stuff, and those international friendlies. Joey, tell us about your first job. Uh, my very first job came in 2007 uh, when I was an actor in New York City, and I answered an ad in backstage uh, for the on-field host for the Staten Island Yankees minor league baseball team. And I auditioned for that and got that. Uh, it was really only between me and one other person because they held auditions on a Sunday morning at 8 a.m. in Staten Island, and it was raining. <laughs> so I think a lot of people, uh, that just gets credit for like getting the job for just basically showing up. Um, but uh, that one, it was a great training ground. I really, I had that job for four years 
Um, and I learned so much uh, about live announce with that job. Um, and then my most recent one um, came through uh, actually another voiceover talent sending me a link on uh, from a website called Teamwork Online, which uh, you find a lot of sports jobs that way. Um, and that had a much more uh, extensive interview and audition process. Uh, and I became the PA announcer for the Washington Mystics. And so that's what I'm doing now. Awesome. All right. And then, uh, Adrian, what about your first job? So I was uh, in college at the time, University of Tennessee, back in the 90s. And I was working at the college radio station. I was also interning with the local sports station, covering a lot of the sports events. And I really realized the niche of announcing that I enjoyed doing, and I wanted to be a part of that. And the local team was the minor league for Toronto Blue Jays. So I was working for the team and right opportunity, right moment. The gentleman had to cover a big story for Channel 6, and they asked if I could cover. So I started covering for him. And then the next year when he uh, moved on, um, I was at the right spot and started doing the baseball then. And, of course, being at UT, that opened up to a lot of uh, women's soccer, the swim team, the baseball team. So I started announcing a lot of volleyball. Pretty much every sport you could get your hands on, and it kind of cultivated doing radio announcing and putting sports together, something I loved both of them. And then from that, it just kind of kept bouncing around as I moved and as I got older. And then uh, my family, we moved here um, in the early 2000s, the Bowie Bay Sox, they had a double-A team. So I immediately applied for it because I wanted to be announcing again. And it worked with great with having kids. And uh, so for 18 seasons, I was at the Bowie Bay Sox. And in that mist, I started backing up with the Baltimore Orioles and took over that in uh, 2021. But I've just always loved announcing and been in the right place, right time, and paid a lot of dues as well. Very cool. I'm noticing a theme here. Um, Mark, your turn. My first uh, announcing job was for my high school basketball team when I was in high school. Interestingly enough, I, I always, people hit you up on social media or, you know, you'll you'll get an email from a student or a tweet or something like that. And something that I always try to tell younger announcers is all of our careers uh, are basically shaped like a bell curve. You know, you start at a certain place, you maybe make it to another place, you try to stay there as long as you can, if that's what you like, and that's what makes you happy. And eventually, you'll kind of slide out on the other side. So I fully expect to be announcing high school sports at some point again, you know, later on down the line. Hopefully it's more of a, my decision than a powers that be decision. But I know that day is coming someday. Um, so when I was in high school, I was a baseball player and I was uh, on the cross country team. I wanted to try out for JV basketball. My baseball teammates told me basically, please don't try out for basketball. You're terrible at basketball. You have no left <laughs> hand. The full court press is there to stop people like you. Um, but why don't you be the announcer and why don't you introduce us the way that Michael Jordan is introduced at Chicago stadium. So uh, I tried that, uh, enjoyed it, did it in college and then did it in grad school at the university of Maryland and, and kind of, uh, I guess availed myself to opportunities uh, while I was full-time in college athletics. And then since then, uh, when I started my business of which uh, sports announcing and, and live sports are very, very big components. My most recent opportunity is coming uh, by invite, by invitation. And I think that's something that uh, I would have in common with a lot of different announcers, sports and otherwise is if you show up to work, if you're reliable, if you're easy to work with, and if you do the job well, and and that might be that might be the order that it really goes in. You know, being reliable, being easy to work with, and also being fast and accurate, and saying everyone's names correctly and with the right pitch, tenor, enthusiasm, etc. Um, that's going to lead to other opportunities. So, if you're a high school announcer, if you're a college announcer, if you're a pro announcer, and you'd like to do more and other things be on time, be reliable, be easy to work with, and be fast, accurate, and excited if that's your thing. And that's going to lead you to other things. Yeah, I was hoping that's where this this question would go and take the conversation because I, found, I got your notes. I found a very similar thing that most of my jobs have been from just showing up and getting referred by other people, including Mark <laughs> in some cases, and Bob, who was going to be on the call but unfortunately couldn't join us. So... I find that just word of mouth is is the best way to find a job. What are some other ways we could recommend to look for the work if you're interested in getting into this type of job? Anyone could just throw out a, a, an answer. 
Uh, for stuff that I, I think for um, like corporate or like big graduation ceremonies or, th or that kind of thing, not so ne not necessarily sports, but looking up event production uh, companies and the ones that specifically do like big events like, uh, you know, conferences, summits, galas, those kinds of things. Um, they're always looking for someone to, to step in and, you know, be a, a VOG or something like that. And that stands for voice of God for people who don't know what that means. So we do have a lot of newcomers to this podcast. Anybody else? How, how else would you recommend looking for work? Sure. I think another good thing is, is just cultivate some opportunities in your own neighborhood. Uh, my very first job was uh, calling a JV baseball game. And I just approached the guy that I knew did the scheduling for the sports announcing for the local district. And uh, I had never done any sports before, but just thought, you know, I was doing voiceover already. So I thought, well, this might be an interesting niche. And, uh, and I said, Hey, is anybody doing the JV teams? And he said, no. And I said, well, could I sit in on a couple of those? And he said, yeah. So uh, I sat in with the baseball game guy earlier that day. And then the next, uh, the next Friday took the JV game and the parents and the players were thrilled to have somebody announcing because up to that point, they hadn't had anybody announcing. So maybe find, uh, you know, find a space that isn't filled yet, that they aren't doing that, but they they play at facilities where it's available and uh, step up and just say, hey, you want me to step in and do that? You know, that was a volunteer deal. I did three games. Then I got hired for softball. Then I got hired by one of the local colleges to move on up the following season. But just cultivating your own opportunities. Joey mentioned teamwork online before, and that's a great place, believe it or not, to find pro jobs, whether it's minor league or whether it's major league in any of the, you know, four, five, six, seven major leagues that there are right now. I mean, you got to look. Yeah, they're out there. They're posted online. You go find them. And uh, and and that's where you can uh, that's where you can approach it. I want to talk specifically about fight announcing, because those that, that's kind of a different um i say the word differently than mike does so a different niche is uh fight announcing you have to basically just knock on the doors and be relentless with boxing and mma promoters you have to find them online you have to find their facebook's you have to find their instagrams and twitters and find their phone numbers and you have to go after them and basically you have to offer a product that they need which is usually a cost effective <laughs> uh announcer and that's how you get into the fight game and if you you know stick with a promoter and you're meeting their needs and their costs which unfortunately um sometimes that is the biggest determining factor at least when you're getting started then you'll catch on with different promoters and promotions and then you can kind of grow your fight announcing business from there i think that's one of the things that i'm asked the most is how do you become a boxing or an mma or a wrestling announcer and the answer is just being doggedly relentless. And then also when the rubber meets the road being uh, sadly cost effective. Yeah, my approach dovetails really well with what Mark was just explaining, which is to be extremely proactive about finding the work. Um, I kind of approach it the, the same way I do voiceover, which is to, and this is oversimplifies it considerably, but decide who it is you wanna work for. Make sure you have the skills and the ability to be able to do that work well then craft an approach, whether that is through emails or phone calls or a dedicated website that you build to highlight a specific set of skills. Craft that approach so that it will appeal to the people you want to work for. And then relentlessly, doggedly be proactive and nonstop about finding those people, reaching out to them, letting them know that you exist. And as some people said earlier, once you have those jobs, do them to the best of your ability, be the nicest guy in the room, be the easiest to work with. And that's where the referrals will come from. One more web resource I wanted to mention is a website called publicaddressannouncer.org. And they usually have a very well tended uh, job listings board there where they bring in listings from various sources and um, you know put them in one place. So that's a good resource as well. Sean, why don't awesome. you pick another question to move to? I don't think we need to do... Amazing responses, everybody. Like like I said, I was noticing a lot of themes of doing like avid research and outreach and putting yourselves out there and, and having kind of a humble mindset about it, not being afraid to start from the bottom and work your way up. That's, that's amazing. So I'm curious, what is everyone's favorite part about announcing? And, and kind of a two-part question, do you have any really memorable, strange events that you've been asked to do? We'll start with you, Doug. Yeah, I would say that my favorite part is the adrenaline rush that I still get 
before every single game, no matter how many times I've done a, a particular event, there's still, I don't see it as nerves. I see it as excitement, that adrenaline rush that, that hits you. I love that. I also speak Spanish pretty well. And even though most of the games that I do are in English, lo hago en español también. And I really enjoy doing those just because of the, the challenge of it for a gringo, trying to make sure he's getting everything right in a different language. And the last thing that I'll say I love about it is having been raised by a mom with a master's degree in English, I am an absolute language nerd. And I, I don't know if a lot of people, maybe you guys here can tell me if you agree with this. I love doing what it takes to, to wrap my brain around the names of international players and doing everything I can to get them just right. I like the challenge of it. It's almost like a puzzle to me. And that has turned out to be one of the most enjoyable parts of at least the game prep for me. Very cool. I also have a master's in English, and I'm a big word nerd, too. That's so cool. All right. Uh, Mike, what about you? Well, uh, I think that the thing I like most about, about the PA announcing and that differentiates it from the other areas of voiceover is, you know, a lot of times we're used to sitting in a booth talking to a mic and, and looking at a wall or, you know, the inside of a booth or, or some foam squares. But when we do the sports, we actually get the real-time feedback and you get to interact and you get to feed off the energy of the actual real-time feedback you're getting from the crowd. And frequently, you know, what you're doing is driving that reaction. I mean, you know, more so obviously what's happening on the field court or, or what have you, but, but you can be a part of helping to bring that to the forefront and to charge the crowd and to get them going and to get that energy. And so you feel that crowd energy and it's, it's in a different way, getting that real-time feedback from all of your listeners, you know, as opposed to, to uh, dictating it into a microphone and it goes somewhere and people listen to it later. So to me, that's, that's one of the coolest things. The most interesting event I ever did is a professional baseball game, independent league team that they had called and uh, asked me to fill in. And I'd already booked the pool in right field for my son's birthday that same day. And it was a day game, so I was pretty sure they were going to call me to back up to and forget that I was already out there. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do it, but I'm going to do the PA from the pool on a wireless. Oh, that's awesome. That was my condition. And they went for it. And so <laughs> I did the entire game standing in a pool in right field about knee deep with a wireless microphone, and it was perfect. And it was awesome. That's and amazing. It was, <laughs> yeah, it's a great time. That is amazing. That is too cool. And I love like how you said that that immediate feedback and, and you really kind of control the atmosphere of the game and amplify everyone up. That's so cool. It's a total case of Sally Field, though, I'll admit. It's 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 they like me. <laughs> they really like me. They like me. There's so many it's times cool. I'm doing auditions where I drop in what I, something I think is funny or something I think is cool. And I have no idea because I'm just talking to myself in this padded room, like Mike said. But, but when I'm out there at an arena or, or a stadium, I can drop something and I get the immediate feedback of the laughter or the booze and and, and both are fun. <laughs> the groans. All right, Adrian, what about you? What's your uh, what's your favorite part in, in kind of a memorable event that you want to share? I'd say that the, when you guys were talking about English, um, I studied a lot of the applied phonetics. I just love truly learning the other languages and truly how to say their last names, the origins of it and playing with that. And again, reacting to the crowd as you're, you know, you could be as the Orioles so many times come from behind and you're down and out and you're two outs, there's no way you're going to win. And yet you can suddenly have five players in a row come up and the whole game just changes around that. Um, also in minor league, I'd say one of my most favorite events was a monkey rodeo because in minor league, you do the most absurd, craziest events to get people to come out to the games. And we literally had monkeys riding on goats and um it was just it was so absurd and yet so much fun and it, I, there's no like you almost kind of had to be there um to explain those moments but um the monkeys they would smile i remember the one monkey's name was sam and he would pose with everybody and just do this cheesy smile and i think that's just you never you're never bored there's always something new and exciting every single day no matter outside the game within the game Joey or Mark, any any comments about either quirky events or um, how how the you enjoy the feedback in a live event? Uh, well, for me, I always say uh, live announce is not about the money; it's about the moment, um, being part of the moment. Uh, and for me, like one of my favorite uh, things I announce every year is the New York City Marathon, um, and I work the the finish line 
uh, which is great to see the elite runners come through and you're all very happy for them. But what really gets me is the 53,000 other people that run the race who are just everyday people like you and me um, and seeing the moment when they they're close to the finish line, this thing that they didn't think they could do, they're 20 feet away from accomplishing. And on that day, like I work a, a seven, eight hour day announcing the finish line that day. And I tear up probably like 10 times because you just get so wrapped up in their own emotion too. And seeing them accomplish this, you know, bucket list item, um, people running for family members and charities. And, you know, it's just, it's such a beautiful day. So uh, anything like that, I mean, like they've said, you know, sports games come from behind wins, major, uh, you know, uh, feats of athleticism are all exciting. And so, like, that's what I love about Live Announce is the unexpected. It's it's the moment, not not the the money when you do it. And I think from my perspective, I just I like being a small part of something that's very big and that's something that's very important to certain people. I mean, if it's uh, if it's a high school game, then the game really matters. The people that are there, the parents, the friends, the fans, the the kids that play on other teams that are there to support that team. And if it's a college or pro game, I mean, take a walk through the crowd about 20 minutes before you have to be, you know, on. And you see fathers and daughters, you see grandmothers and sons, everybody's wearing the gear, everybody's really excited for the game. And uh, you're the person that starts it. You're the person that gets it going. Um, people, people have asked me, over time, you know, how come you never wanted to do play by play or, you know, something like that? And I say, I joke and I say, I'm selfish. You know, I like it. I like for people to clap after I talk, you know, you get that instant <laughs> feedback and the instant gratification. And, but, but really, I mean, that's, there's, there's nothing, no better feeling than whatever level you're at, walk through the crowd about 20 minutes before kickoff or tip off or, or whatever, and just kind of take in how much it means to so many people and, uh, what a cool thing to be a part of, of making their day better, making their week better, you know, and, and for people that use sports to kind of forget about uh, their more challenging times or, or difficult times. I mean, you, you make their lives better. You get to be just a tiny little piece of something that's going to help, you know, help so many people uh, enjoy their lives that much more uh, in terms of unique or strange or, uh, you know, events. I was the Broken Cyclones announcer for 13 years, and we've had Seinfeld night seven or eight times. So I've been in the booth with Jay Peterman, with Bizarro Jerry, with um, nice with uh, the woman who challenged George to save the whale when he went and pulled out the, the Titleist. And I have a, a signed Titleist golf ball from her. Uh, we did the, you know, the Elaine dance contest, the Snickers uh, eat a, you know, eat a Snickers with a fork contest. I mean, we've done every single, you know, every single thing. I have a Fusilli Jerry. I have a little Jerry Seinfeld, uh, chicken, uh, well, rooster, rooster fighter, rooster warrior. Uh, I have a soup Nazi bobblehead in, in my, uh, in my office as well. Um, but the, the event above all events that, uh, was the craziest for me was I did FDNY versus NYPD ice hockey at Madison square garden. And it was, uh, I think a noon or a one o'clock puck drop with Dwayne Wade coming in to play the Knicks on in his final appearance at Madison Square Garden that night, right at seven or seven thirty, something like that. So the tickets for the NYPD FDNY hockey game are five dollars. The beers are eighteen dollars. So the place is packed, and then everybody, nobody cares about the price of beer at that point. Everybody is just drinking as much as they can, except for, of course, the children, and there are very, very many. But the place is absolutely packed. Madison Square Garden, Saturday afternoon, and the year before, they had tied, and FDNY and NYPD did not want to tie, right? They want to score goals. They want to fight each other. They want to drink beers afterwards and then get on you know, to the rest of their weekend. Uh, and the people in the stands certainly have a head start on the beer drinking. So they had they changed the overtime rules in a way that they thought would not result in a tie the year that I'm announcing it this next year. Well, as you can imagine, we're getting into overtime. Then we're getting into the second overtime. And the people that work at Madison Square Garden are very, very nervous about the ice change over to the hardwood. Dwayne Wade and the, the Heat are at their hotel. And they've returned from shoot around. And it's time to start making a move toward basketball so say to me over my ifb over my headset hey fratto we got to finish this it's time to read appendix z in your binder 
I said, but I don't want to, I don't want to read Appendix Z. Like, no, no, yeah. Can't somebody else read Appendix Z? No, 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 no. So I leave through to Appendix Z and the game's going to end in a tie. And I have to ask these 20,000 people in various states of uh, inebriation and consciousness to leave Madison Square Garden because Dwayne Wade's coming in in just a few hours. So, all right, pull the sheet out. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your support of the NYPD and FDNY this afternoon. This game has ended in a tie, and we do have to ask everyone to please rise safely and appropriately exit Madison Square Garden as we're setting for the Knicks and the Miami Heat tonight. I was booed by 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden on a Saturday afternoon, and that is an experience that I hope to never uh, revisit, but one that I will not soon forget. That's hilarious. So one thing Mark mentioned was uh, just the stroking our own egos when we get the feedback from, from the fans, which I totally can identify with. So along those lines, I want to know what was the biggest venue that you've announced in? And we can just go quickly, you know, rapid fire around the room. Um, uh, mine was probably CQ Stadium at Maryland, which holds just 55,000 people. It wasn't that full for a lacrosse game, but that's the biggest building I've been in. How about um, Adrian? What's the biggest uh, building you've announced in? Stop me on that one. I am trying to think on that. Um, JFK um, or RFK in uh, D.C. Do you know what that held? Ooh, I, I, mm, 60,000 maybe? Then that is the, it did not, it was a Georgetown football game. So it was a very small crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, but that is the largest facility I've been in then. Uh, Doug? Yeah, mine would be Hard Rock Stadium where the Miami Dolphins play. Just a few months ago, actually, there was an international friendly between the national teams of Honduras and Argentina. And because there's some guy named Lionel Messi who <laughs> plays for Argentina, they sold that game out and the crowd was absolutely insane in the best possible way. 65,000 people. Awesome. Uh, Joey? Uh, probably, I mean, it's not a building, but Central Park on Marathon Sunday, uh, has a lot of people, 53,000 people run the New York City Marathon every year. Um, a building is probably Radio City Music Hall for me. Oh, okay. Great. Mike Norgard. Uh, I've called games at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Globe Life Field, Globe Life Park. Uh, biggest game would be that Mark was was nice enough to have a conflict uh, for the Commanders Classic in November, and that was at Globe Life Field in Arlington. So Chuck Morgan, uh, the PA guy for the Rangers, and I tag teamed that and worked that together. So thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. <laughs> but was happy to sit in for you. And Mr. Frano. Uh, Giants-Browns preseason in 2018 uh, it was Saquon Barkley's first game. Eli Manning's the start of his last season. Uh, and it was also uh, Baker Mayfield's first game. HBO Hard Knocks was there. And my wife was pregnant with our first son and due uh, that weekend. So it was a Thursday night game. She was due that Saturday. I, I got them to agree to allow her to stay in the booth you know, just uh, kind of on the second tier behind us. So uh, I'd be a little bit calmer, but it, it did little to uh, to assuage my nerves. Uh, I did Army Navy game during the pandemic. Um, there were, I think there was only 12,000 or so in the stadium, you know, with uh, social distancing and COVID and stuff like that. There was a president in the building that day, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, even if, if you didn't like that particular president, which... Uh, <laughs> No names. I'll never, uh, never admit to it now. But, um, but that was that in terms of the, the the hugeness, the gravity of the game. That was that was pretty big. But it was during COVID, so of course uh, restricted. All right, awesome responses, everyone. I'm like super impressed and giddy now. <laughs> so as we talked about before, everyone here does various genres of voiceover work. I'm curious, how does the announcing fit into all the other work you do? Like, what are kind of the main differences as far as style and performance? And we'll start with uh, Mark. So I've found that most of the voiceover opportunities I get are related to the teams that I do the live event announce for. You know, I mentioned before um, I'm one of the voices on NBA 2K because every home venue on NBA 2K features the home announcer. So uh, I think we've done three or four years of that so far where, um, you know, you go into the studio and the first year, I think we did two 40-hour weeks just doing every player's name in the league 
as if they were on your team, as if they were on the other team, all the different um, prospects that could, you know, could be drafted that year, uh, you know, in terms of college and international. And then all like the cartoon players that they have on there too, all the ones that you just make up and just kind of put together. Um, you know, they, they, they do that, but most of the, like I said, most of the voiceover opportunities I've gotten are, uh, are through the teams that, um, that I announced for haven't really been successful. Like uh, a lot of you other guys on the, you know, on the commercial market or the promo market or anything like that, I guess, um, you know, maybe what they tell me what they would on occasion is, uh, if your voice lends itself to live sports, it's not always super successful for that sort of thing, but they may be just trying to be nice. I don't know. They may be just trying to let me down easy. It's not you. It's me. That sort of thing. Well, listen to the previous episodes of this podcast and you might learn a thing or two and we can help you. <laughs> All right, Mike, what about you? Well, I, I think it's just kind of adds to the diversity of the portfolio of work. It's a nice break. It's a getaway, you know, game days. Um, I may do, you know, one or two, short one-offs and then I'm out the door um, to the venue. And so it's just, it's just a nice change of pace for me. Awesome. Adrian. It's a, it's a very different style for me. It's for some reasons, um, been radio for a while. I, you know, did all sorts of different commercials working in fantasy and XM, but going from like audiobooks, which I truly enjoy. And I definitely like the genre of uh murder mystery and that style to me, that's more um, it's deeper. It's, way breathier and a different style um i haven't been doing it as much uh as often as lately but to me they're extreme and it's uh extreme differences but it, they're both so fun in their nature in different realms i guess very cool yeah audiobook seems like a much more intimate experience <laughs> and they take a lot longer it just that, that you have to like it's a whole different style of how you're breathing and getting into the character and really knowing the book versus yeah it's very solo Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the workflow. I mean, as everyone said, the PA stuff is very immediate. Like you might be working a single day for eight hours, but you're done when you're done. And audiobooks could take a whole month or more just for a single project. Joey, how about you? Uh, most of my voiceover work is uh, commercial work and uh, like corporate narration and stuff like that. So it, they do feel like two very separate uh, ways of working. Um, if, if I had to identify overlap, it would be uh, bringing your own self to both of them, your own personality, bringing energy to both of them, um, trying to connect with the listener in both of them. So the, in those ways, they kind of overlap. But uh, but yeah, one is definitely a lot louder than the other. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, in, in your like like Adrian said, like your breath work is different. Um, you know, your stance is different. Uh, how you attack the language is a little bit different. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with the commercial work that I do, I guess the sponsor reads that I do during timeouts, um, probably <laughs> sound a little more, uh, commercially than, uh, announcer -y. but, uh, yeah, those are the, that's how I see the two, um, work together. It's funny you mentioned cool. the, um, the, the crossover with bring yourself to the audition. Sean mentioned that to me a couple of months ago after I had been, doing a bunch of lacrosse and, and minor league baseball. He said, you're getting much better at improv. And I said, yeah, I think it's from the live announcing, doing the crazy zany contests that Adrian was talking about at minor league baseball, doing the, the, the games and things they do with the, the fans at, at lacrosse. I have to improv all of that stuff. And sometimes it's somebody in your, if, if you're lucky enough to have an IFB, they'll be talking to you. More often than not, the events I do, there's someone literally standing next to me yelling in my ear, say this, we, we have to do the sponsor read for... <laughs> for Dietz and Watson right now. And I just have to make something up. So that has helped me tremendously with auditioning over the last year or two. And I think that's the biggest crossover for me. Mm -hmm. Being able to think on your feet quickly and just like you said, that the adrenaline of the moment, it all adds up. And uh, Doug, go ahead and uh, wrap up the question for us. For me, the biggest similarities between my voiceover work and my PA work is that I'm talking into a microphone. And that's that's almost where it ends, except where, like Joey said, there are the sponsorship reads, which are pretty much commercials. So that feels pretty similar. But I don't have what is typically thought of as your deep, rich, resonant male announcer's voice for PA. So I'm, I rely on being more of a hype guy when it comes to PA, which is a very different approach than my voiceover work, because most of that, having branded myself in voiceover as the announcer, most of my voiceover work is more casual, conversational, friend next door kind of stuff. 
and doesn't sound anything at all like my PA work. So I, they're similar disciplines, but, but the approach for me is polar opposites. But that's great that you mentioned that, Doug. I actually used you as a teachable moment for one of our GVA performance workouts. This one talent was working on a Home Depot spot, and he's like, I, I didn't submit because I don't have, I have a mid-range voice. I don't have that masculine sound. I was like, have, when was the last time you heard a Home Depot commercial? Do you know who Doug Turkell is? And it just like completely blew his mind and built his confidence up. It was like, everyone's got their own masculinity. Dude sounds like he goes to Home Depot. What else do you need? <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. The um, the commission check is arriving soon, I assume. <laughs> yes, sir. Should be here later this week. <laughs> I'll be looking for it. Okay. So wrapping up, uh, I can't believe we've we've actually gotten to the end of these questions. I appreciate everyone's time so far and your your honest and open feedback. But something a lot of us are concerned with in the VO world and probably a lot of artistic endeavors is AI and how that's creeping into some of the work we do. So where do you see the future of announcing? and taking into account AI. My personal opinion is that this might be one of the only genres that is future-proof, but I could be wrong. Where do you see the future of announcing and how it will battle or be creeped upon by AI? I'll start with, uh, I'll start with the unannouncer again. Doug. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I haven't given this specific topic a whole lot of thought because I tend not to focus on AI in terms of voiceover. It's it's been the main topic of conversation in the voiceover world for the past couple of months, but I choose to focus on things that I can control. So I'm aware of it. I keep tabs on what's going on, but whether a client chooses to use AI or not is entirely out of my control in terms of my voiceover work. So I really don't worry about it too much. For PA, off the top of my head, I think it probably has begun affecting our work when it comes to Voice of God stuff, pre-recorded announcements for award ceremonies and corporate events. Some of that might be going to AI. But like you said, Paul, I think it's going to be a long time until sporting events switch over to AI because there's so much immediacy needed. And the nuance that we bring to it, the way you announce a player based on what's happening situationally in the game, changes from moment to moment. And Eventually, they'll be able to program AI to do that. But until then, I think we're fairly safe for sports PA. How about Adrian? What do you think? Um, I think I like to think that we're really safe speaking of all those moments and in the moment. And you can say to an AI machine, okay, we're going to give this a little more enthusiasm, a little more embellishment. Let's make the voice deeper. And you can change all those things. But no one can be of that moment when a certain star steps up to the plate and call it women's intuition or just a gut feeling from your stomach, nobody can replace that. And it can have nothing to do with the atmosphere or the guy sitting next to you, the person yelling or the little kid that just happens to lean over. You just have this moment where I think this could be something and you give it a little extra. So that to me, no robot in the world can do that. No one can tell the robot to do that in time. So I'd like to think as far as sports goes, that we are safe for a very, very long time. Mike, what do you think? I mean, I, I agree with both of those. The situational awareness, the ability to, to um, you know, deliver with those fine shades of difference, not only the situation that's going on in game, but also understanding, you know, what's happening with the crowd. Do they need pump? Do they need push? Is the crowd carrying it on their own? Do they need kind of a, a softer sell here because they've already got it? What's going on? There's so many different factors that you really have to analyze and take into account and deliver and respond accordingly that I think it would be difficult, um, you know, for an AI to capture all of that at this stage. And I, I hope that is the way things are for, for a while yet to come, obviously. Mark. Oh, live sports is the last true reality television. And I don't think you can replace real live with fake live. Uh, and then the other thing from a practicality standpoint is if you're in MLB, NBA, NHL, NFL, and you miss time or mess up a replay review, a coach's challenge, anything like that, There are, or if you're in the NFL and you talk under 15 seconds on the clay, play clock or you deliver inflection under 20 seconds on the play clock, there's real fines and real money that are levied against the team that you're announcing for. Hopefully that doesn't come out of your check personally, but uh, the, I mean, the, that's really there. So I've been in situations before, um, 
I mentioned Army, Navy earlier, and they said, well, you have to introduce the president three times. We think we want to record that. And then I said, well, you're going to leave it to the DJ to play the right, press the right button in that situation. Or you want to go with the trained announcer, the professional announcer that's going to, you know, deliver the, you know, the weight of the moment, but also, you know, read the right announcement at the right time, you know, say the right thing at the right time. And at the end of that, I think they weighed um, whether it was like something that they could control, what could they control more? You know, what, what could they have influence on the most? And at the end of the day, the live guy or gal, in this case, guy, won out. And Joey? Uh, yeah, I would just echo what everybody else said about how uh, I think Doug is correct, that it's it's easiest point of entry into ours will be uh, voice of God work and, um, you know, ceremonies, co- corporate ceremonies, things like that. Um, but again, context matters in live events. And uh, and currently we are cheaper than the algorithm they would have to make to have AI understand uh, context. So <laughs> until until we reach that tipping point where we are no longer cheaper, uh, <laughs> I think I think we're OK. Yeah. I mean, how do you program AI to do a pulse reading of the crowd? Like it's, <laughs> you know, but think about that. Maybe it's like the volume of the crowd. How long has it been since they've cheered? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, like someone, maybe someone's feeding metrics of like player down, you know, or something like that. I mean, they're, they'll figure it out, Yeah. but will it, will it be good? Will it be cheap? Um, those are, those are the questions that uh, have yet to be answered. Absolutely. And I love how both you and Mark pointed out it could actually be quite expensive for or have very expensive consequences to try and use it before it's matured. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for being so generous with your time and your responses. I learned so much about what you do, and I would like to start learning more about it myself and maybe finding some local opportunities, too. So um, quickly, before you leave, is there anything you want to promote? How can people get a hold of you if they'd like to work with you as a PA or a VO? We'll start with you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for having me on here and being a part of this discussion with so many fantastic people. A lot of you guys I, I know and I've met and some of you guys I haven't. So look forward to uh, coming down Doug's way and seeing Messi, I think, in the in the future, maybe. So you can follow uh, business-related accounts at Lineker Media. That's L-I-N, like Jeremy Lin, the basketball player, Acre Media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And then if you want to follow me, it's at Mark Brado. That's work-related stuff plus pictures of the kids and the uh, and boat adventures. So if you, if you want all that, the robust content is at Mark Brado. The, all the work-related uh, content is at Lineker Media. And thanks again, guys. Our pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much. Mike, your turn. All right. Uh, socials are Mike Norgard or VoiceOver Mike, uh, voiceovermike.com is the website the email is mike at voiceovermike.com and uh yeah if anybody's got uh, got jobs or wants to give me some money please feel free to reach on out if you want to follow me do that too thank you mike adrian i'm on linkedin as my name adrian robertson uh on instagram and twitter it's just adrian on mike and that's where you can find me and i also have uh, some family pictures mixed in there but those are my main accounts very good gotta mix a little bit of the personality in there yeah <laughs> Joey, what about you? Uh, I'm a girl named Joey pretty much anywhere on socials and on my website. Uh, And you can hear me if you're a runner in the New York City area uh, at New York Roadrunner Races. And if you are in D.C., come to uh, the Entertainment and Sports Arena. Come to a Mystics game this summer. They're pretty good. Great. And last but not least, the announcer, Doug. Yeah, you can find me at unnouncer.com, spelled just like announcer, but with a U in front instead of an A, and email is doug at unnouncer.com. Well, thanks, everybody. Unfortunately, there is no break for announcers during the summer, but enjoy what you can of the sunshine and warm weather, and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good thanks. one. Our pleasure. Have a great day, everybody. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do 
Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, VoiceActorWebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. All right. Thanks to everyone who participated. Mark, Joey, Adrian, Mike, Doug. I was so happy to have all everybody on the on the call and able to chime in, except for Bob. Bob did apologize later for not being able to make it, but he was on vacation, and uh, I'm sure he was having more fun than talking to us poor schlubs. We poor schlubs? We poor schlubs. <laughs> us poor schlubs. But got more assonance that way, too. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, thank you, everybody. It was such a pleasure having you on the podcast. So that wraps up this episode of the VO Meter. Measuring your voiceover progress. Coming up next, we have voice actor and instructor Nadia Marshall, who is going to be telling us about her lead generation blueprint course, as well as her uh, illustrious career in the voice acting and singing. We'll also be having Matt Calrick coming on after that. So keep your ears peeled for that, and you'll hear us in the next one. Thanks for listening to this episode of the VO Meter. To follow along, visit us at www.vometer.com. We'd also love to hear your comments or suggestions for the show. Or if you have a questionable gear purchase, tell us all about it on our Facebook page or on Twitter at the VO Meter. 